Okay, it's November 18th, 2012. We're at the Boston International Book Fair doing our interviews this year. And our next interview is with Ian Kahn of Lux Mentis Books. Ian, good to see you, man. Sorry that you're not feeling that great with your foot and stuff, but um, tell us a little bit about your background. Family, education, uh, where you grew up, or where you lived, et cetera. Give us a little biopic of you. Well, I... Um I was born in Maine and, and grew up there, brief, brief stint elsewhere. Um, father's a physician, medical historian, mother's a librarian. Um, my grandfather was uh, born in Belfast, Ireland, but, but came over early, Horatio Alger story, but a, a lay Joyce scholar um, and a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. Uh, I basically grew up with bibliophiles, if you will. Books um, all around you. Books all around, heavy on Irish lit. I, uh, I wrote a book report on Finnegan's Wake at 15. Oh, my God. Um, wrote it cyclically using Joyce's language. Oh, God. Um, and I had the, ran into the teacher decades later who um, acknowledged we were chatting about different things, and she said, you wrote that paper. She said, I have to tell you the truth. I read it. It was 15 pages long. She said, I read the first two pages, didn't understand a word of it, and gave you an A-plus and moved on. <laughs> I sort of thought it was good, but I really worked on it, so I was a little conflicted about that. But um, went ended up interested. I'm an old school hacker, I'm a crypto guy. Um, but I got lazy in college, so I ended up going to law school instead of pursuing <laughs> theoretical math. Um, and uh, what law school did you go to? Case law, Case Western Reserve yeah. School of Law, and um, that was good. It helped me learn that I had no interest in practicing law, um, so I ended up going corporate right out of law school and um, ended up starting starting my own company and then uh, sort of starting and doing some turnaround work for, for a number of years. What was, what was uh, this business that you went into after? Uh, well, what I went into after was a, a, a funny company that did long tail claim recovery for, for environmental exposure issues, um, but it was right at the time the brownfield statutes were coming out, uh, and I ended, up, I ended up starting a company that bought, remediated, and redeveloped environmentally contaminated industrial sites, um, and, uh, and got out of that. And it's a fine craft in the book business. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I have a, I like, I learned early on that I don't like things when they run well, um, I like companies in transition. I like sort of complex problem solving. Uh, and, you know, one of the myriad of pleasures of the book trade is it never really runs well. It's, no. It's, it's, it's a day-to-day -day challenge. Mm -hmm. Complex uh, problem so, solving, for yeah, sure. Yeah, complex problem solving. Um, but it was always my retirement, you know, the trade was my retirement plan. Um, at 55, I had long, you know, from my 20s, been convinced that I was going to sell or extricate myself from whatever I was doing at 55, um, start around this age, sort of accumulating material so that I could do that. Um, and about 10 years ago, uh, a very dear friend for whom I had helped with books and things in his life um, called and said that he'd had a, a life change and that he was sending sending property to, to auction and he had 150 boxes of books and that I should stop whining about the book business and just, you know, he'll put <laughs> up his books and I put up mine and I should just go ahead and do it. And uh, I had the foresight to marry up. Um, <laughs> we I, all I, did. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, I, I, I married a Harvard Business School girl who oh, uh, is, is sharp as a tack. Yeah. And we crunched numbers for a, a couple days and it was, it was the proverbial offer I couldn't refuse. So um, it let me start with a, a body of work that, that I couldn't have started with any other way. Um, and that really helped. Uh, you know, it, this is very much a trade where having, having material of a particular sort tends to lead to other material like that coming to you. Um, and starting with particularly nice things was, was uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. and, really is. and still. Uh, and you're up in Portland. I am. Now, do you operate uh, by appointment, or do you have an open uh, facility? I, I run an appointment-only shop. Um, we have a 
we have a row house in the west end of town, and um, I'm, I'm, it was around 1910, it was converted from a single family to, to, to two units. Um, we live above, and there's a rental on the first, and I've taken over the front room of the rental, and my, my fantasy is I'll ultimately take over the 1,200 square feet and, <laughs> and take the entire first floor as the shop. Um, and I have a little, uh, I will acknowledge that I have a little Rosenbach obsession. And in my fantasy world, um, I'm going to, we'll, we'll end up picking up the adjoining, one of the budding row houses and merge them into one. And I can sort of, <laughs> and build I, can your re, empire. I, can, I can redo what Rosenbach did in Philly and Portland. <laughs> well, that, that'd be quite a trick. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 it'd be cool if you I'm could. not going to hold my breath, but it's, <laughs> it's good to aspire. Um, I looked on your uh, web page before just to get a little idea of what you dealt in, and it says here that uh, books that have been treasured and will continue to be treasured, whatever your interests, fine press, artist books, Americana, fiction, film, blah, 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 Lux Mentors provides a diverse selection. So you've got, you're really not really specializing in anything, but you're sort of specializing in a lot of things. I'm, I'm... I have a really short attention span, is what it boils down to. Um, I, what I do, I do two, two things broadly or generally, depending on. Um, on one hand, and what that really ties to, I do a lot of collection development. I build private libraries. I, I build private collections um, and some institutional work as well. And I deaccession private collections. So it's very hard, you know, no, I'm not a general, you know, I'm not, I don't deal specifically in this or exclusively in, because it often varies. Um, a lot of what I do is sort of transformative work with collections where someone who's been sort of a passionate but general book collector gets to a point where um, often a spouse has said, something has to change. <laughs> um, and I do a lot of conversions of aggregations of books into cogent collections and then and, and, and sell off portions that don't fit the, 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 the overarching uh, scope. Um, so it really varies. Um, and I do that, I do that working with others when it falls, you know, I'm, I'm working with a, a collection, a deaccessionated collection right now, um, which has a lot of early, early printed science, a lot of early science not in English, which is complex. Yeah. Um, and then a, a not insignificant Arabic um, early manuscript Arabic, which is disparate from everything else, yeah. and um, you know, I, I work with others. This is what it well, what yeah, it boils you, down I, to. No one can know everything. Uh, that's exactly right. Um, I love, however, uh, exceptional pieces in all areas, and that's you know what I love about this. Um, I like to say I'm a vicarious collector, which is to say I get to collect all these things that are fabulous and wonderful and I get to covet them and play with them and stroke them and, and enjoy them <laughs> um, and then find a home for yeah. them. I vicarious possession. I, I don't need to have it forever. You know, the, the trick is to have it and to learn from it and then to have it find the Go right on. home. On yep. its road. Yeah. Now I do, I do specialize a little um, which is to say, a, a not insignificant you know, stop by the booth. A not insignificant portion of what I have is modern fine press, um, modern fine press, modern lutiatis, modern book art or artist books, depending on which emphasis you wish to place the syllable. Yeah. Um, but that has a lot to do with. Well, you know, I'm 45 years old. I have no intention of doing anything productive with the rest of my life except this. <laughs> Um, and if I get to do this for the rest of my life, the onus is on me to bring along and, and, and others of my, you know, of, of, of my age bracket, if you will, and younger, to bring along the next generation, not just of, 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 collect, you know, of collectors, of dealers, um, but also of creators, of, of, of printers, of book artists, of um, less so writers, but you know, just because it's not, not an area that I, I, I don't think it's relevant. Um, but the printers and, and creators broadly, you know, we're at a really interesting tipping point where the ubiquitous case-bound book is falling away. Um, and I think, I, I, I suggest and I hope that we're at a point where 
someone like the Vale Press or, or Golden Cockerel or, or Derridale, these sort of um, boutique houses that produced very approachable books at one level and rather dear books at another. But they were well designed. They were, they were not just, you know, when you walk into a, a retail bookshop these days, new hardback, they're, they're not designed but in any sense right. of the word. They're not designed, they're poorly printed, they're poorly bound, uh, they're men. Yeah. As that goes away, and, and it's unfortunately, it's, it's, it's poisoned the well a little bit. It, to some extent, with the, you know, there are the exceptions define the rule, but broadly, it's hard to convince people that books are, are what they are. They're significant, they're cultural artifacts, and, 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 and truly important in our being as a society and as a culture, it's hard to convince people of that when they're everywhere. Yeah. And, and you just, it's like breathing. Breathing is really important, but you don't think about it at all. Yeah. Books are really important, but people don't think about it. As ubiquitous case bound fall away, that book is object, that thing that you hold in your hand, I think, I hope, is going to, to come back in the depth of its meaning, if you will. And um, I think we're actually at a really interesting tipping point for, for that kind of book and for engaging young people in what it means to hold a well-designed book in, in one's hand. We'll uh, see. When, when we talk about the, uh, the obvious, the selling part of the business rather than the acquisition, uh, how many book fairs do you do uh, on an annual basis? Uh, ABA and regional. Okay. I would say not enough. My wife would say far too many. Too many, right. Um, I do all of the ABA shows, uh, which is to say the two East Coast and, and one West Coast. Um, and I do, at this point, I think I'm down, I think I'm down to only about, I want to say eight, um, eight or ten. Um, I've, I've cut down some simply because I'm traveling and traveling more to meet with special collections, to meet with, um, and it's hard. Uh, it just logistically, it's hard. And, um, and I have very mixed feelings about that because frankly, I really love doing fairs, but I also, um, I try to learn from both my mistakes and my shortcomings. Um, I set up a very particular kind of booth and it takes me a ridiculous amount of time to do it. Um, and it takes me the same amount of time I'm not good at changing how I do things, um, depending on circumstance, which which is probably a problem. But I've learned to live with it. But you know, long and short is, it takes me about eight to ten hours to set up a booth, whether it's a one-day fair or a four-day fair. Yeah. Um, so it's hard for me to justify doing any one-day fair because it's just shockingly painful to, mm. just logistically painful. Um, I, I'm looking at it on a, you know, we really do, my wife and I spend a lot of time thinking about sort of fairs and trips and how to, how to, how to do the trade. You know, the bottom yeah. line is the trade's in transition in, yeah. in big, complex, subtle ways. You know, all at the same time, um, I think there's this interesting potential to do boutique. Um, I've talked with a couple other, I, I like this idea of sort of trying to do a traveling show where you know you plan a trip between three three to five cities, maybe with another bookseller or two, and and set it up in you know hotel suites. Yeah. Uh, I know some art dealers who do similar things, and um, you know invite special collections, invite um, you know book clubs in the area, etc. Um, there have to be different ways to to skin this cat, if yeah. you will, um, and particularly as there are less and less open shops. Figuring out these opportunities, whether they're large fairs or, or regional fairs or um, sort of a, uh, these tra traveling show uh, yeah. idea, creating environments where people can come in and handle things and play with things. Uh, you know, the web is a fabulous tool, but you can't, you know, you, you can't read a description and really experience a book. You can't even see if there are pictures. You can't even see pictures and really experience the book. Um, the only way you experience it is is to hold it in your hands physically. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah. 
a long answer and not directly on point, but um, <laughs> you know, long and short is I do uh, about eight to ten shows a year, um, east and west coast, um, and we're always looking at kind of how to how to reach how to reach out, how to draw uh, new people in. You know, we don't. There are a lot of different models in the book trade, um, and there are people who do. Um, there are people who do fairs. On, uh, almost, you know, one a week, and it's how they, it's how their business that's, functions. That's the way they do it, um, and that's how, you know, and that's the way their business works. And it, and and if your model works that way, and there are certainly people who do it, that's great. Um, book fairs have always, since we started, um, book fairs fall under advertising on our P and L profit yeah. loss statements. You know, it's it's a branding effort. It's it's getting out there and being seen. It has, you know, for us, fairs have much less to do with what you actually sell on the floor right. than than who you meet and the relationships you 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 create and nurture and and bring along. Um, and it's it's often, you know, it's six months later when someone calls and says, you know, I was in your booth and I love the way you and I have similar things and would you be interested in helping me? Right. That's what fairs are. You know, for, what, for us. what percentage of your business do you would you say you do at fairs uh, on on your website or perhaps through some other kind of uh, uh, advertising tool like a catalog or something of that nature? Huh? Yeah, um, that's what everybody I, says. I should, you, yeah. Well, it, the tragic thing is you should be interviewing my wife. Um, <laughs> maybe maybe I will. Really the, the, the brains of the operation. I'm I'm just a pretty face. Um, I like I like holding books. Um, I, I actually I can't tell you what the percentages are specifically. Um, you know, relatively, it, it, it's not that it's insignificant. The book fairs aren't insignificant, um, but but you know I I would be surprised if it was anywhere near a quarter. Yeah. Um, our web presence, you know, our web presence is very much an advertising and branding right. thing, and, and I've experimented with that aggressively and in a bunch of different ways. Um, though directly, you know, direct sales, again, relatively small. Um, you know, it's 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 largely the development work I, I do and, and word of mouth and um, sort of uh, off off the chart stuff tends <laughs> to be a little a little more um, complex. Now the web is interesting though because there have been times, and it's not consistent, but um, you know one of the things I've been experimenting with recently, video as it happens, um, I shoot videos of, of all, particularly the major shows, but at this point just about every show, I do a video tour of the booth just after I've set it up and I try and get it posted before the fair goes live. Uh -huh. Um, and I've been, I've been taken aback with how many people look at them, mm. uh, because at the end of the day, it's a long video of a relatively long. Five, I try and do about five minutes, um, you know, of a booth, and it, it's not particularly well produced um, by any stretch of the mm. imagination. I don't, you know, it's it's very off the cuff, um, but people watch and they seem to like it, and I've more than one occasion. I've had people who've been in the booth. I've had booksellers who weren't showing at a show, had shopped it, and I got an email from the next day saying, you know, and I'd seen them in the booth, you know, we do yeah. kibitz, and the next day I said, you know, I happen to be looking at your video and I missed this, and do you still have it? Isn't that um, and I've actually sold things because of that. Because of the video. Um, same thing with Facebook. I, you know, I tend to post sort of in process pictures, um, mainly because for me, setting up booths is such a Sort of a, Sounds like a, a sadomasochistic way. element to Absolutely, booth design yeah. for me, um, and I've had people, you know, I've received both emails and text messages directly because of Facebook, um, saying, you know, is that people who weren't coming to the show, you know, not, is that whatever the book was, you know, in this picture, and and I've had things go that way. Wow, um, that's pretty cool. Twitter. Uh, so you're you're you are using social media as a, as a tool? Yes, um, as a, as a way. Again, this is the I don't have an open shop. I don't have young people, young collectors in the in the arc of collecting, who can come in and sort of hang out with me. 
um, and talk about books and, and sort of find those, those who are passionate. And, um, and as I say, we spend a lot of time thinking about this because finding those, social media creates, I think, I think I'm right about this, social media is, is currently one of the best environments in which you can create that kind of, um, it's not exactly a personal, people like to talk about it as a personal relationship, it's really not, um, but it, and yet it sort of is, which is mm. to say people get a sense that they know you. I mean, I, this, this weekend here, I've had at least a half dozen young librarians, and I mean under 20, you know, still in library school to under 25 in the, you know, in the business, who have stopped by the booth and say, I follow you on Twitter. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, we're friends on Facebook. Um, Twitter especially, I have an inexplicably large following of young special collections librarians <laughs> and archivists on Twitter. They're very engaged. Um, and, and it's very, you know, it's very interesting. And it, it, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter intrigues me because there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to look at it, and, and yet at the same time, it's, it's inexplicably strange yeah. to get your head around. And I think it's an interesting, I think it's interesting in a complex area. Um, I don't think it's a particular, social media broadly, I don't think it's a particularly good space to deliberately sell material, um, which is to say people tune it out. Um, which, you know, I, I do the same. There are, there are a handful of people who are, are you know, who regularly post things they have, or um, and I don't see them. I mean, I just I skim them. I, it's, yeah. it's noise. It becomes background noise. Um, with all social media, the the trick is separating signal from noise. Old crypto thing. Yeah. Um, and you know, your goal is to be signal. Your goal is to have content that you're putting out there. That's what engages people. That's you know, this whole sort of idea of bringing people along, what you want to do is grab their heads and, and make them interested. Um, I decided long ago that I would not be, um, I have a particular personality, um, <laughs> and I tend not to hide it. Um, I'm, I'm of the, there are lots of us in the trade, and if you want to find someone who, who fits, you know, there are plenty of people who will fit almost any personality, and, and I'm okay with that. Um, I would much rather work with people who 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 are besotted with idiosyncratic behavior, um, <laughs> and, and and I'm you're in the right to, trade, uh, you know, no <laughs> doubt. Um, but the same is true with social media, which is to say, people follow people who they like to engage with, who they like to hear, who they like to listen to. Um, I, you know, people tease me because I post a fair bit. Um, you know, I tend to I a lot of what I read. I have ways to, you know, it's, it's very easy to post things I find interesting. Um, and, you know, if you, if, you, if you don't like things I find interesting, then you need to mute, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm yeah. not offended. The flip side is there are lots of people who do like it. And, and finding your space and finding space that you're comfortable with, and that's the key, um, is, is a little tricky. Um, that said, I think it has real value um, but it's a long game. Uh, but that's not to say that, sh you know, that, that th interesting things don't happen. I, I had a Twitter follower um, who I had posted, you know, I reposted a fair bit of his because he posted fabulous, interesting things. Um, very geeky, very, very yeah. biblio geek stuff. Um, and out of the blue one day, and he, and he I as well, um, and out of the blue, one day, I got a, a direct message, a private message from him um, in which he, he said that, you know, having spent a couple decades looking for this archive of, of Montague Summers that, that was lost in the 50s, there's a kind of famous article that was written about it back then, um, he'd found it um, mm -hmm. in, the, in, in the hinterlands and, and the people who had it were interested in placing it and would I know anyone or be interested in helping, um, you know, there is, he and I had never met, we've never met to this day. Mm. Um, everything we've done has been long arm and, and he introduced me to the, to the family who owned this and um, one thing led to another. It's, it's happily ensconced at Georgetown. 
um, <laughs> and, and, and is really, you know, is going to be a tremendous scholarly research, uh, scholarly resource. Um, and it never, it certainly wouldn't have come to me, and there's this interesting potential that it might not have come to light um, were it not, were it not Twitter. Yeah. Um, and that's a, you know, that's pretty bizarre. <laughs> yeah, it is bizarre. Um, we've got a few more minutes left to, to talk, and I wonder if there are any people uh, in the trade who acted as sort of mentors to you, people who you uh, asked questions when you first came in, who gave you the answers, uh, people who you still consider to be someone you can uh, ask a question and get a good answer from. Um, lots. I'm sure lots, but anybody in particular flip off your head? Uh, Priscilla Javellis. No, Priscilla, yeah. Um, you know, Priscilla was, was, Priscilla has been tremendously supportive of me. She was my sponsor for, for membership. Right. Um, I, you know, she's a, she's a, she's, she's been a great friend and her husband and collector. D Dan and is, Dan, a, Dan yeah. is, is one of my favorite people who I don't see. I, I have a pathetic tendency. I don't leave the house. <laughs> um, so even though they live relatively close, you know, you know like in my miles mind, I want to visit them every day. <laughs> yeah. And and the reality is, I see them more often at book fairs than I do in life. Right. Um, uh, you know, this we the amount of sharing, the amount of of, of thing, the, the way people interact in the trade. Um, it, it's unlike I, I come at things. You know, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, lawyers are appalling to get to each other, yeah. generally speaking. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 a remarkably interesting thing how well the trade works together. Um, there really are too many, you know, too many, too many to mention. Yeah. Um, but it's there, there was something I wanted to. I, I've I've just lost. Um, You've misplaced a thought. I misplaced a thought that I that I wanted to capture. Because I, I do think, I really, I've, I've lost it completely, which is tragic. Well, it's not but, um, tragic. It's just a sign of your age. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, the way, oh, I'm sorry. It was back to Priscilla. Yeah. Um, there's a wonderful photograph of Priscilla Javellis um, in which she's, she's seated and standing at her corner, at her shoulder, I think actually with his hand on her shoulder, uh, is John Fleming, who who was her mentor. Uh, right. And, she and, worked for and John. Worked with John and, and brought out her first catalog with, yeah. with him. And to John's right on the wall is a portrait of Rosenbach. Yeah. Um, and, and Fleming, of course, started as a as as the door boy at, at Rosenbach's That's shop right. at fifteen, opening the door for, for people. Mm -hmm. And and that continuity, Rosenbach to Fleming to Priscilla to, to me. To you, right? The, um, you is know, a connection. I've, I've, I've said to Priscilla before, you know, in, I, I would love, and we'll see if we can ever make it happen, I would love a photograph of me seated with Priscilla standing with her hand on my shoulder and a portrait of John and a portrait of, <laughs> of Rosenbach um, because that's what the trade is. Yeah. The, you know, it's this... It's this line, this history of, 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 of passion and love of the book and of, of perpetuating that, of, of bringing it forward, the, the cultural history of, of, of our people, yeah. if you will. Well, you know, uh, we have just come to the end of our period. We've enjoyed the 30 minutes with you. It's been great, Ian, and I appreciate you taking the time to do this for us. Well, and have fun. a good fear. <laughs> Let's hope so. Okay.